To See the Moon by Marlene Olin. What she hates most are the lights. There's no dawn, no dusk, no silver sliver falling through the slats. Instead, a light as bright as a photographer's flash burns day and night. She's almost sleeping. She would die for some blessed sleep. And had she, instead, she hears the squeak, squeak, squeak of a nurse's shoes. Put a note on her chart, Esther Lipinski. She's, she's refusing intubation again. And the noise, did she mention the noise? The beeps, the alarms, the frantic whispers. This is Lipinski, can I get you a sip of water? This is Lipinski, remember that you need to breathe. She's landed on an alien planet. Only she's the alien and spaceman hover. The shields, the suits, only their eyes and voices set them apart. The black one, the one with squishy shoes and worried eyes, holds up some sort of mask. The CPAP's harmless, she says. Really, pretend that you're swimming, Mrs. Lipinski. Pretend that you're coming up for air. Her mouth tries to speak, but the words stay trapped inside. No, 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 she waves. No, no, no. But she's drowning. And the deeper she sinks, the more the male nurse scolds. Some sort of accent. Two eyebrows linked like one long mustache. Keep your hands down, Esther. You're swatting the doctors. You won't we tie you up? If she turns sideways, if her nose edge closer to the keyhole, if she jammed her foot hard into the wood, it was possible to breathe. Esther was 10 years old. It was her 45th day in the cabinet. The city was Vilna, the year 1941. I got your cell phone, Mrs. Lipinski. Your daughter wants to talk. It had been their favorite hiding spot. First, you put the key in the lock. Then you push through the clothes. Behind the clothes, if you look closely, lay another door. Their father was tall, taciturn, dapper with a smart goatee. It was your mother's idea, he said. Then he offered the smallest of smiles. The nurse holds the phone inches from her face. This is Lubinsky. I can't stand here all day holding the phone. You gonna say hello or what? You see, said their father, when you push one door, there's another. Clever, right? Then through the wall, there's an attic, the tiniest of attics, a cubbyhole big enough for two. Then he held up a finger. Tell no one, not your friends, not your cousin Yankee, not your Aunt Mindel. It's a secret, yes? We're like conspirators, said her brother, like pirates hiding in a cave. My children, said their father, my brave, brave children. On the screen, a face is speaking. It's an image in a funhouse mirror slightly familiar yet startlingly stretched let me show you how to slide the dead bulb said her father what a clever cabinet do you know another cabinet that locks from the inside and outside boat only later did esther understand when the soldiers came she grabbed the key and rushed toward the wardrobe hurry she said to her brother for when her foot stepped into the attic no one followed Instead, she heard lamps falling and dishes crashing, her mother shrinking, a cry, and then a thud. The black nurse is persistent. You're 89 years old, Mrs. Lipinski. This virus is screwing with my scoreboard. You know what I mean? I'm planning on getting you to 90. After that day's silence, she had no idea where the soldiers took them. All she knew was that people disappeared. First the Schwashkopf down the street, then the Bernheim boys from her school. But she was safe in the attic. It was like camping in the attic. When she lay down, her head touched one wall, her toes another. Her mother had left a loaf of bread, a jar of jam, a pitcher of water freshly filled. She slept on a nest of old blankets. The first few days swept by. Your oxygen level's at 77, Mrs. Lipinski. You ought to be dead. Why aren't you dead? Then one morning, she dreamt of woodpeckers, peck, peck pecking at her head. When she woke, the floor was shaking. At first she waited, hypnotized, paralyzed, listening to the voices below. And all at once she remembered the slide, the inside locks. It takes five people to turn her on her stomach and suddenly like a miracle she can breathe. A bird inside her chest starts fluttering, its wings thacking, quacking hard against her ribs. Esther was incredulous. A new family was moving into her home. 
during the next few weeks thanks to the keyhole in each disembodied voice became a face another taciturn father a mother who fussed and fidgeted directing the workmen like an orchestra conductor put that here no over there higher lower under but instead of a son and a daughter there were three boys of their ages hester only guessed my face she wants to tell them please don't cover my face when the mother tried to unlock the wardrobe hester felt death's hands on her neck for hours the mother tried to pry it open never guessing there was an inside lock as well at last the father shouted leave it alone hildy and Amwa's worth a fortune. You're going to crack the mahogany. Such mahogany doesn't come cheap. The old woman's sliding. Let's get some plasma in that port stack. That keyhole was her portal to sanity. During the day, she could see the light climbing up and down the walls. In the evenings, everything was black. The walls would shriek. Her throat would tighten. Her very smell made her gag. Then she glanced out the keyhole and wait. If only she could grab the sky, see the moon, touch the stars. And finally, a ray of sunshine would puddle the floor. A puddle would turn into a pond, a pond, an ocean of light, dark light, dark light. One day blood into another, somehow time pushed on. People are always crying. The man who was next to her, stark nude except for the tubes, died the night before. While the machine still hummed, they let his wife and a priest say goodbye. I'll see him again, right, said the wife. They'll let me see him again. No, said the priest. It's too dangerous. It's an open secret. The bodies are carted to the morgue. Then after the morgue, the mortuaries. There is no rending of clothes, no heartfelt speeches. Both the dead and the living are abandoned, forsaken, bereft. The black nurse looked like she was sobbing, meanwhile the male nurse opined. What'd she expect, a fucking mass? Casseroles and homemade pies? Hester learned their schedule. What time the father went to work, what mornings the mother did her shopping. When the boys were dropped off at school, every day she got a little braver, or she stole some food. Then she helped herself to a book, a pad, a pen. The wife was crazy with grief. I want to hug him, she cried. I want to kiss him. Then she started taking off the mask, the goggles, the gloves. Each day she grew bolder and bolder. Then on the 45th day, her luck ran out. The priest panicked. He turned to the nurses with a shout, for the love of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, please help this lady now. But life takes twists and turns. No matter how much you brace yourself, each path is uncertain, each step a surprise. The mother and father and mother were unexpectedly kind. They always wanted a daughter, they told her. So they let her live in her hiding place until the war was over. They brought her food, books, clothes, and after the war, they helped her search for her family. It was years before the truth surfaced, her parents dead in the pits of pine. Her brother gasped in Auschwitz, and though her story could have been sadder, not a day passed by when she didn't miss her father's smile, her mother's touch, her brother's laugh. She moved to New York, married, had children of her own, but like a ship without an anchor, she felt adrift. There were no grave sites she could visit, no dates she could commemorate, no prayers that eased her pain. It's your daughter again, Mrs. Lipinski. And suddenly the face on the screen takes form, like drops in a bucket. The parts converge to form a whole. It's Natalie, the oldest. Of one thing Esther is certain, this leave-taking, this severing, may be God's plan, but it's not hers. Not yesterday, not today, not tomorrow. She takes one deep breath and then another. My children, said her father, my brave, brave children. Your oxygen's at 93, Mrs. Lipinski. That's good. That's real good. Look at you, Esther. A fucking miracle. We can use some miracles around here. With a steady finger, she touches the face on the phone. Don't worry, she whispers. I'll be home soon.